Welcome to the final video in the Designing for Unit Tests lecture series. A quick recap of the series so far. In the first video we showed the mechanics of unit testing with XUnit. In the second video we used our ability to rapidly write and run tests to do TDD, Test Driven Development. In the third video we took the red pen to the original design and applied solid design principles to make the code more testable. In particular, we made sure to depend on interfaces. Well now that we have a much cleaner design, we get to have some real fun. I'm going to show how to use a mocking framework to make the unit tests easier to write and allow us to write even more sophisticated types of tests. So let's think about the state of our testing code. We were passing into our currency converter a custom implementation of the I exchange rate provider interface. Uh, we were dependency injecting it, if you will. Why the custom implementation? We could have presumably just injected the same object that our production code will use. And as a matter of fact, sometimes you can get away with that. But often these objects won't provide the ability for you to set things up in the repeatable manner that is needed for your tests, or those things will have so many dependencies that you're not going to be able to uh, you know, uh, it, un untangle all of the, 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 the dependencies they have. And, and what if this implementation needs to read data from a database? Are you going to mess with the database tables to trick that code into providing the data you want? What if it fetches data off the internet? And then so on, which is why we came up with the static exchange rate provider. It could be a controlled implementation that will allow us to test our class in a consistent manner. But I want you to think about that static rate provider. What we did was we hand rolled our own class to substitute for the real implementation. The key is we wrote it and now we need to maintain this test code. And this actually gets to a common complaint I hear about unit testing all the time, which is that, ugh, it often feels like you're writing the same code twice, once for the unit test and once for the real code. Instead, we actually want to have these substitute test objects be easier to make. So I'm going to reuse a phrase from the first video. We're supposed to be in the business of writing banking software, not writing fake objects in this case. Fortunately, there are frameworks that are in place that can help us generate these substitute objects for us. Now, there is a lot of terms for these substitutes. Offhand, there's a double, fake, dummy, spy, stubs, and, and mock. There's a bit of disagreement on the exact nomenclature and precisely what they're all supposed to do, but we're going to be in the rough ballpark, and they all, they all amount to effectively doing the same thing. Well, the first one that we have is fakes. This is a simplified version of an interface. Now, this is essentially what we hand-rolled ourselves. The static provider was a complete implementation, but it was a simplified version that took shortcuts compared to the real implementation. Namely, it had a fixed set of currencies and rates that it would use. Stubs are often used as something that short circuits trying to figure out what values to return in favor of just reading a pre-canned list of responses to questions in a particular order. Um, what day of the week is it, Stub? Monday. What day of the week is it tomorrow, Stub? Monday. And the day after that, Stub? Monday. Okay, Stub, what time is it? G gotta go. Throw exception. Loosely, a Stub is just a less comprehensive type of fake. Mocks are related to both of these, but they get to the heart of tracking all the calls made so you can look back and confirm that the behavior of the code was correct. So as an example of this, think of a home garden system. When the sensor monitoring soil dryness gets too low, you want to verify that all the eye sprinklers received a request to pop out of the ground and start watering. If they don't, you'd want to fail that particular test. So now we get to do stronger forms of testing that are validating that, are validating that the code is behaving as you expect and not just returning correct responses. So we're going to use mock, uh, aka mock-q, uh, as our framework. Either name for that is acceptable. There's also msfakes, uh, fake it easy, and nsubstitute uh, in .NET. Now to give some love to the C++ developers, I personally use Google mock, though fake it has its fans as well. Now we don't want to write these fake classes ourselves if we can at all help it. Uh, and this gets to another side benefit of writing our code to use interfaces. We can give these libraries and these frameworks like mock the interface and it will auto-generate an object that can respond to any of the public methods with responses we specify. It can track which particular calls were made. You can have it trigger events. 
You can even have it track if your code that you're testing registers for an event. And then in the end, you can validate that only the calls you expected were made. Each individual test then sets up its mock objects for its own custom needs. You only specify the behavior for the feature your code is supposed to be testing for that one particular test. If the function you're testing against goes off the expected path, you'll get test failure since the mock object can't give an intelligent response. So this is another benefit of keeping our tests simple and not making these giant Swiss Army knife all-in-one tests. When you make these Uber tests, it gets progressively more and more difficult to be able to mock them, which is a sign to step back and split it into multiple simpler tests. So now let's see if we can apply this into our existing unit testing. Well, so the first thing we want to do is we want to get rid of that static exchange rate provider that we refactored out at the end of the third video. And recall that I said that the code didn't really need to exist, and I meant it. It has been an awkward fit since the beginning, and we have been moving it around and ugh, just trying to work around it the whole time. Well, here's our chance. It's finally time to be able to move this to the scrap heap. So we get to go in here. So I've commented out all but the, but the first test here. So we're going to go in. We're going to take this out. We're going to delete it. It's gone. Oh. What a relief. I feel so much better now. Now, of course, this code obviously isn't going to work because we don't have a static exchange rate provider, so we've got to be able to get that into the currency converter. What we're going to do is we're now going to get the mock framework to be able to do that for us. So the first thing we need to do is we need to add a package dependency on that. So let's add a reference, NuGet package, add a NuGet package reference. There it is. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to add mock. And it only has just a couple of, oh, no, yeah, just a couple of, oh boy, a couple dependencies. And we're going to sign it, oh god, yeah, oh goodness, okay, ah, sure, I accept. I've probably signed my life over to mock, but there we go. So now we have it inside of our code. And now we can ask the framework, hey, can you go ahead and create for us? Can we create something for us that will satisfy our iExchange Rate Provider interface needs? So we go ahead and we say, OK, Mock, here's an iExchange Rate Provider. Make something. So let's go ahead, tell it about the. There we go. So, yep, it works. So now we've got our rate provider. Well, actually, this rate provider is not an iExchange Rate Provider. What got returned back was actually this. I'm going to call this this shell object around an auto-generated instance that implements the interface. So this shell is the thing that we're going to talk to in order to set up what is going on to do certain things in certain circumstances. And this shell is also responsible for tracking what did and did not happen. So if we try to pass this shell to the currency converter, you're going to notice that it's going to go, oh, no, that's not right. Because yes, this is a mock I exchange rate provider we have here. It is not itself an I exchange rate provider. But never fear, it is very easy to get at the real uh, internally generated object by just using the dot object property. And that is the one that returns the real deal I exchange rate provider. And it's this thing that's going to be forwarding back to this shell object for and, and coordinating with it for everything that needs to be done. So I said, or sorry, so since this first test that we're doing is converting from the same currency to itself, we hope that it's never actually going to need to actually look up any exchange rate stuff. Now, we need it to obviously pass a real object in order for it to be able to potentially do something. We don't know if there's you know, data validation in the converter that would reject us passing nulls. Perhaps that is another test that we could do. But what we've got here is something that effectively is called a dummy. So this is a real instance of the interface. It's a real tangible thing that's been constructed, but you can't actually do anything with it. So it's really it's just a trivial version of a stub. Well, we can run the test now with that, confirm that this is indeed the case. So we do that, go ahead, and we can see all the tests ended up passing. So our code inside in Currency Converter, it's agnostic to the fact that, oh, we're now passing in a dummy object instead of any of the other myriad of I exchange rate providers that we've been using in the past. And that's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. This code that we have in Currency Converter really should never need to be modified again. OK, well, now let's take a look at doing something that needs actual values from our mock. So let's make a very simple fact to convert 100 US dollars to Canadian dollars. 
So I have that code already written that copies, you know, the use of the mock that we had from before. So let's go back over here. So I've got it over here. It is, I'm going to uncomment this. So again, it's basically the same as before, rate provider that's there. The only difference is the money is now going to be 100 US dollars. And more importantly, the currency for what we're going to be expecting back, we're expected to get $133.10 back, right? That's, that's effectively the test we had from, from way back in, in, uh, in lecture one. So the rest of the code is identical. So we create the, the mock shell and we're going to pr pass the, the internal implementation on to our converter. And we can actually try to run this test. Now I want you to think about what you think is probably going to happen. All right, we go ahead, build, we run. Well, that poor dummy object actually was put into a very uncomfortable place. It had no idea what to do because it can't do anything. We never told it any exchange rates. So as far as it's concerned, it has to cope the best way it can. And all it's going to do is just return a default value. And what's the default value for a nullable type? It's going to be null. So if we take a look at what happened when we ran the test, that bears out with what we saw. So we knew what would happen is we were first going to look up the source currency, then we're going to look at the target currency, and we can see right there. We actually got back a, 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 a not supported exception. Hey, that source currency, unsupported. So let's go in now and let's tell the mock object, hey, here's how you're supposed to be handling getting requests for, you know, US dollars, Canadian dollars, whatever it happens to be. So the first thing we have to use is... this. So we're going to put in, we make a call to the rate provider and you call setup on it. And what setup is going to do is you're going to describe some sort of behavior that you want to happen with that, with the mock object. So what are we trying to do? Well, we have to specify for it which function uh, that, that gets called that we want to qualify with what the behavior is going to be. So you specify that using a lambda expression. So what the lambda is going to be is what it's going to try to match against. So what are we going to try to match against? Well, we're going to be calling uh, inside of our code, uh, inside of the code we're testing, we're going to be calling get exchange rate. So we put a lambda for that in. So anytime someone calls get exchange rate with some potentially some parameters, we want to provide some behavior for that. Okay, so what do we put in for the parameter for this? Well, we know it's going to be one of the currencies, so let's actually specify that. So what was the source? The source was US dollars. So let's put that in there. And now what we have here is we've told the provider, hey, you're going to get called with, uh, uh, someone's going to make a call to get exchange rate, and they're going to pass US dollars to you. So expect that call to be coming. Now, we haven't told them what to do with it yet. And the way we do that is we chain this with a, with a call to dot returns. And that specifies what it should return when that call gets made. And if you look at what we have here, well, if you break it, if you look at the individual pieces, it kind of is a little, a little annoying, especially if you're not that comfortable with lambdas. Well, it actually reads very nicely. Hey, for our mock rate provider, whenever somebody calls get exchange rate and passes in US dollars, can you please return 1.00 decimal? Well, that's, that's pretty readable. Well, let's go ahead and run the test now. So we run. Now we're still going to fail. But this time, if we take a look at it, we can see, well, we didn't get any complaints about the source currency. It's now the target currency that we have to worry about. And, you know, that makes sense. We only specified one of the two currencies that were going to be used converting from US dollars to Canadian dollars. So let's go in and provide a second setup that's going to do the second half and tell it, well, this is what's going to happen when, whenever somebody calls get exchange rate with CAD, what I'd like you to return is 1.331. So now we have all the information in place to be able to satisfy the test. And now when we run our conversion of $100, we should get back the $133.10. And that bears out from the code that we have here. Now, if we want to, we can actually debug into our code uh, and rerun the test so that we can actually see that happening. So let's debug in. So rerun the test, debug. It's going to get in. And now we can t just quickly take a look around. So we dependency injected the exchange rate provider, and we can see that there. You can see it's a mock I exchange rate provider colon one. So it's the internally generated name for what it, what it created. So that's the thing that we're talking to. And we can now watch it 
go through. So we called get exchange rate with USD. What did we get back? 1.00. So yes, it has a value. So now let's do it for the second one. So now we're going to call it on CAD. And what are we going to get back? The target exchange rate, 1.331. And at this point, we, you know, everything is as before. We run the test and it produces the value and generates the correct result. Now, what happened with the original theory was we actually were doing a bunch of different concurrencies that we had there. So how would you actually handle that for this? Well, there's two ways to do it. One is you can create a single helper method that calls dot setup on all the possible currencies and reuse that one helper method uh, in all of your individual tests. And that's fine. It's, it's okay if you, if you do that. At that point, we've effectively mimicked the fake from what we had before. But there is another option, and the one that I tend to prefer is to actually have the inline member data just specify only the conversion data that you care about for that particular individual test. And this allows us to do things like perhaps test different exchange rates, even using the same currency inside of the same theory. And it also means that we can better detect if we're erroneously making calls where we shouldn't be making them by forcing all other possible calls to effectively be stubbed out. They won't do anything and effectively make them inactive. So I find that that makes the test just a little bit more robust. All right, a very common thing that ends up happening is great. You can return a value when someone makes a call, but almost, almost certainly the first time you're doing any type of testing, eventually you're going to go, I need to call this a bunch of times, and more importantly, I need to call it a bunch of times, and I need to get different values back. So let's go ahead now and start looking at how we do that. So before we were using setup. Well, there's another call you can make instead called setup sequence. And it's virtually identical to what we did before. So for the setup sequence, you would say, whenever somebody calls get exchange rate with a currency of CAD, the first time I'd like you to return 1.234. And then you can chain that into further and more dot returns dot returns to specify what the sequence is going to be. So the second time that somebody calls us, I instead would like to return 6.54321, or whatever the numbers happen to be. I imagine in our exchange rate one, you would have first return 1.23456, then 1.23457, then 1.23500, and so on and so forth. It'd be small incremental changes, but that's up to you to decide for your tests. This is the mechanism that allows you to do that. Now, what happens when you want to do it where, what if you don't care about what the currency is? I know I'm going to get called, I'm going to get called a bunch of times, and I don't particularly care what the actual currency is because that's not the focus of what my test is supposed to be. So instead of hard coding the particular constant currency type, what you can do instead is throw a blanket sort of wildcard statement around it and use this it.isAny. And what that says is this parameter can be anything of the type currency. And at that point, regardless of which currency you pass in, it's going to be considered a match for the purpose of this sequence. So the first time you call it with, say, British pounds, you get 1.234. The next time you call it with euros, you get 6.54321. Uh, or if you happen to call it again with British pounds, it would have returned 6.54321. So all of them get funneled into the same sequence, and they're just going to pluck them off one at a time. So now you can imagine that this little code fragment could be used in a fact or theory where you're doing a single conversion because you know it's going to be called exactly twice. No one's going to call get exchange rate more than that. And you can then worry about whatever the behavior is that you're trying to track for that particular test. Now, eventually you're probably going to go, oh, well, that's great. I want wild cards, but I still also have to sometimes specialize. And yes, you actually are allowed to do that. You can mix and match your setups and your setup sequences to be able to accomplish it. So in this case, as this is as, as before, but what I've done is I've added in the first, hey, I want to specify that when I get an exchange rate of USD, in that case specifically, I want to filter that into a separate spot and always return a value of 1.0. So for this, anything but USD currencies are going to use this sequence. USD is going to use this one. So the last thing I want to discuss is that you can have tests that do more than simply just set up inputs and check outputs. I want to start showing you how we can start to do things to validate that certain calls were made with certain parameters. So you can even go as far as validate, hey, did your code even register a callback with an event in your interface? 
So as a simple example, suppose you wanted to check that uh, when you were testing the converting money from the same currency to itself, it never actually called get exchange rate under any circumstances. So this is very similar to the very first test that we did where we were doing our, you know, we did our test and then we, we actually just checked the, the result we got back was exactly the same in the assert phase. So our arrange and act would be identical to that first mock test. But what we're going to do this time is we're going to check to make sure that the behavior was correct. So th for a separate test, we're going to assert that uh, the mock shell can confirm that the converter never even attempted once to even make a call in to get exchange rate. Again, if it had of, we may not know it because we still would have returned null and maybe it did something to realize after the fact that it didn't need to do that and went off into other code. Well, now we can actually catch it if it happens to do something like that. So the way you do that is in the assert phase, you do the dot verify call. And what the dot verify will do is it will go through and it will be able to look for specific behaviors that you're trying to validate against. So this looks very much like what we were doing for the setups where it's going to verify, hey, uh, tell me what happened with all with, with the, uh, the the calls to get exchange rate with any currencies. So lump those all together. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me how many times that occurred. And then we're going to check to see how many times did it happen. Did it happen? No times. And if it turns out that it was called, then this thing is going to fail the test and we're going to see something in our in our test output for that. And you can make this condition at the end pretty sophisticated. You can say, oh, I want it to be exactly one time. I want it to be exactly five times. I want it to be less than four times, and, and so on and so on. And you can see the ideas behind all of that. Now, at first glance, it may seem like this was a pretty pointless test. I mean, I'm sure someone's going, Ugh, big deal. So you made a couple extra unnecessary lookup calls. What does that even matter? However, I want you to think about something in the real implementation at the scale of a real bank using, you know, real exchange rate providers. Well, those lookup calls in the real exchange rate provider is going to be doing things involving fetching data off the wire, uh, you know, do, do, doing a network lookup of some sort. Now, I want you to suppose that 99.999% of those transactions that you handle in your bank don't actually require currency conversion. I'm sure they, they'd like as many of them as possible, but generally speaking, most transactions tend to be same currency to same currency. But if everything is being run through this potential convert currency function, a mistake in the behavior of the code could actually lead to every single transaction the, ba the bank makes doing these two extra network fetches for currencies, of which 99.999 of them weren't necessary suddenly this could put a huge burden on the network that wouldn't otherwise be there. And now we can design a test that can actually start catching these types of behavioral issues earlier on. And this is the type of testing that can't easily be done with traditional input-output pair testing. All, they c all those tests care about is, did you do the right results? I don't care how you did it, just make sure you do it, you, you, you give me the correct values. But this type of behavioral testing can be invaluable to raising the overall quality of the production code. And the nice thing is using true mocking frameworks, it's no more difficult to accomplish a test like this than it was to do anything that was using just generic fakes and stubs that were just providing the input values that we needed for our functions. So this entire lecture series came about from a simple 10 line function to convert between two currencies. What it shows is how it is show how easy it is to innocently enough make a pretty bad design decision that can stunt future possibilities. And when you do everything correctly and you apply all the good software design principles you learned in school, a lot of this stuff like unit testing and whatnot, it becomes effortless and it starts to become second nature. So here's a parting shot. I'm going to give you a little reenactment here of some code that I once had to step into in, in earlier days in my career. The point is not to embarrass anyone, any team, or anything like that, but rather it's to point out just how easy it is to get off track, especially if you don't know what the traps are in the code you're writing. So a couple of developers needed to quickly implement a proof of concept for a demo they were asked to do. So being concept code, its initial designs were not rigorously scrutinized. Well, good news. The demo was a fantastic success. Bad news? Suddenly people wanted to start selling this almost immediately. Well, it's actually good for the company. It's just bad for people that value clean code. 
So this code needed to be shippable, and more importantly, needed to be shippable in a very short order. And it also needed to have some new additional features thrown in to make it at least feature complete for, for Rev1. Well, suddenly this rough concept code was elevated to becoming the scaffolding for this new product that was decided to be important for the company. Now, I'm going to assume that the inner software developer voice that the programmers had was telling them that they should probably revisit the design. But they were probably convinced that they could just fix things up as they go. Maybe they just didn't know any better, but I'm going to give them a little credit here. Besides, new features are way more fun to write than just going back and rewriting old code. And since their current implementation was fresh in their mind, they could be rock stars and rapidly get all this new code written, and they would be hailed as heroes. Little by little, the classes got bloated, and special cases were hacked into the code as they came up. Copy-paste was used very liberally. Brief attempts at unit testing were quickly shelled because the classes changed so frequently and the tests would break constantly. And with all the hard dependencies, it was very, very difficult to re re rework them. Besides, rock stars need to look productive. So then the avalanche of eventual bug fixes and new features started to pour in as this product got out in the wild. Well, what happens then? Now the team has to grow. So new people were brought in and they were confused by the organization of the code, but they quickly fell in line with the pre-existing standards of way of doing things with the code. I mean, it, this is the broken window theory. Besides, those rock stars did not want any of them to go in and do any major re rework. They did not want to endure that because that would slow them down. But as time went on, they eventually moved on to other, other things, yet their code lived on in that horrible state that it was in. And oftentimes now, the current maintainers only half know why anything really is the way it is, and they're stuck having to deal with classes that have ballooned to over 15,000 lines long. There is almost no ability to write any meaningful unit tests due to the avalanche of these hard dependencies in this mess of spaghetti code. And then that takes away the key tool that one would use to, start to leverage for starting to do the refactoring. And the sad thing is... I've seen this story not once play out, but I've seen it on at least three separate code bases. And, all right, full disclosure here, a very younger version of me was once that rock star developer that left some kind of embarrassing code that did require someone else to clean up. Not at the scale that I've talked about here, mind you, but I carry that shame with me on a day-to-day -day basis and use that to make sure I never repeat those mistakes. Now, the good news is, is you can hopefully see when these type of problems start. You, you start to recognize them very, very quickly. And even more good news is that even if you inherit some of this untestable, untestable code, there is a path forward. Little by little, you can carve out from that class that has 113 member variables, is that you can carve out little smaller and more reusable pieces that are in fact unit testable. If it's done carefully enough, you can minimize the risk of reintegrating those pieces out from the, uh, of the mini refactors back into the, into the code base. It won't happen overnight, and it can feel like it's improving at only a glacial pace, but it is possible, and if the code is important enough, it's necessary to do that. But more importantly, though, any new code you write hopefully won't be destined to repeat those mistakes. Well, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture, lecture series.